Hello, I'm Lydia Kavraki. I'm honored to give this talk and I would like to thank the organizers of the conference for their kind invitation. I find the topic of this conference, Democratize AI, particularly compelling and timely, as AI and robotics are going to touch every facet of our lives. Especially today with the pandemic, the adoption rate of AI and robotics technology has increased and the theme of the conference is more important than ever. Today, I will talk about the activities of my laboratory in the area of open source software development, and I hope to show you how this effort has benefited our lab as well as others. In robotics, we have solid evidence that our community can benefit from open source effort. ROS is a prime example, and I firmly believe that both academia and industry will gain if we support each other in open source efforts. My laboratory is at Rice University in Houston, Texas. In fact, my background shows the building where my office and my lab are. We are a laboratory with a long history of work on motion planning algorithms. And we use this niche for the solution of complex robotics problems and the design of autonomous systems. Our goal is to have a robot that is able to perform a variety of tasks in a variety of settings. Hence, generalizability is very important for us, and not the tailoring of the performance of a particular algorithm to a particular application. We look for general principles and solution frameworks. We want to consider the scalability, robustness, and safety of our solutions. What I'm going to do in the rest of this talk is describe a significant piece of open source software that our lab supports, ONPL, and then tell you how we and others have benefited from it. Let's get started. Over the last 15 years, my laboratory has spearheaded and provided significant financial support for the development of OMPL. OMPL stands for Open Motion Planning Library. OMPL is a collection of sampling-based motion planning algorithms. In order for me to explain what OMPL is, allow me a few introductory slides. The classical version of the motion planning problem considers a known environment, a robot, its properties and its constraints, and finds a path to move the robot from a start to, to a goal configuration while avoiding obstacles and respecting all constraints. It has been shown that the theoretical complexity of this problem is very high. For example, planning for a chain of end links in 3D is P-space complete. Think about our modern manipulators. They're far more complex than an end link chain. Despite these pessimistic results, we have efficient solutions today for a large class of problems. How do we do this? Well, we abstract, we forget parts of the problem, we provide local solutions, and we accept the fact that we may fail to produce a solution even if one exists. In general, it is a trade-off between completeness of the solution and efficiency. Today, I would say that there are four main classes of approaches for solving the motion planning problem. Sampling-based planning, discrete search methods, optimization-based methods, and control theoretic approaches. I will not go into details. Some of these methods may be better suited to a specific class of motion planning problems than others. I have been involved with sampling-based methods from the very beginning. It has been very interesting for me to watch the evolution of all these methods. Uh, so how do these methods work? Here is a one-minute explanation that captures the essence of PRMs, or probabilistic roadmap planners, and other related methods that use sampling to create a roadmap of the configuration space. This drawing represents a two-dimensional configuration space. Black denotes obstacles and white denotes free space. PRM will guess a very large number of points, that is configurations, in that space. A PRM will keep around only the valid points, that is the ones that do not collide with obstacles. Then the planner will attempt to connect nearby configurations. Connect means um, that an attempt will be made to find a path between the two points, the two configurations. If the path is in free space, it becomes part of the roadmap. Several local connections will be made. Ideally, the roadmap would capture the connectivity of the free space. Once a start and a goal configuration are given, the planner will connect them to the roadmap and will search the roadmap for a series of edges that connects them. It's very much like the way we use a map. We get to the highway and we uh, follow the highway until we are close to our destination. 
I will not discuss how the nodes are generated, how the connections are made, how collision checking is performed. In fact, I will not exaggerate if I tell you that there may be a hundred papers that discuss all these aspects, and these aspects influence the performance of the planner. Roadmap software advantages where multiple uh, planning problems are solved, but when a single plan is needed, trees offer much faster solutions. Hence, algorithms such as RRT and EST and KPs have gained significant popularity. Careful implementation and decision choices can yield impressive results. Anyone who has used these uh, planners, however, knows that the paths obtained by the vanilla versions can be rather bad. Uh, once we got some kind of solution to motion planning problems, we turned our solution into finding good solutions. Uh, hence, we've seen the uh, growth of asymptotically optimal planners. In these planners, the discovery of an optimal solution is assured asymptotically. It's a nuanced notion as really what is shown is that any smooth optimal path with enough clearance can be approximated. Initial optimality results applied only to geometric planners, but at the same time, we gave a good understanding of how to plan for kinodynamic systems. And we arrived to asymptotically near optimal kinodynamic planners. The solutions provided by these planners cannot be arbitrarily away from the optimal as the number of samples increases. OMPL implements planners in the categories shaded by yellow in this slide. So let's talk about OMPL, the Open Motion Planning Library. This library is the product of efforts of many people. OMPL is a C++ library that implements several sampling-based motion planning algorithms. It's intended for educational, research, and industrial use. It can be obtained from my webpage, and its public repository is with GitHub. It has a broad base of users and an active users list. I hope that if you are in need of a sampling-based motion planning library, you will take the time to check OMPL. Currently, there are more than 40 different algorithms with high-quality implementations in the library. My group conceived the idea of the library and its overall design many years ago. Several algorithms in the OMPL library were implemented by us, but several were contributed by others, often by the authors of these algorithms. OMPL is a very generic abstract API for motion planning concepts. The library provides default implementations when possible and implementations of commonly used instantiations are available. OMPL does not represent robot in geometry, does not compute forward and inverse kinematic, does not provide collision checking routines. Because of its inherent design, OMPL levels the field for the comparison of sampling based motion planners, and I will say more on this later. The idea of the library started in around 2000. In fact, I wrote the beginnings of a library, and then I counted five of my students that completely rewrote the library as they did not like what the person before them had done. We were all motivated by the observation that all sampling-based planners use a well-defined set of primitives that should be implemented robustly. The major effort, however, that resulted on PL happened between 2006 and 2008. The first release was in 2008, and the most recent release is in June of 2020, and this release added six new planners to the library. I'm grateful to Willow Garage for their funding at the early steps of this work. The heart of one of my students, Yuan Sukan, who kind of built a library for them, and then they gave back by supporting the implementation of OMPL in my lab. Honestly, it has been a struggle to keep the effort going and find funding for it over the years. I'm grateful to NSF and Rice University for supporting these efforts. From Rice, several people have contributed. Most of the credit goes to Mark Moll and Ioan Sukan, who were the original developments, and Zach Keystone, who has made significant contributions recently, and several other members of my group at Rice, who either con contribute directly or whose work led us to the OMPL uh, library. The success of the library, however, has come from researchers outside RISE. From GitHub, you can see that there have been sustained contributions by several people over the last 12 years. Our pages acknowledge each person who has contributed to the library. Just to give you a few statistics, now we have around 3,000 registered users, and many more get OMPL from package managers or do not register. 
The GitHub repository of OMPR has been forked 280 times. I sincerely hope that if people who have forked the library uh, have further additions to the library, they will contribute this back to the open source repository so that the library remains a valuable resource for the robotics community. Our webpage for OMPR since January of 2011 had, uh, has had more than uh, half a million sessions and more than 200,000 unique visitors and more than 2 million page views. An easy way to explore the library is through OMPR app, a lightweight interface to the library. Um, it assumes a robot and an environment representation, uh, as triangle meshes, meshes and provides collision checking routines. So there are many sampling based algorithms and OMPL implements many of these. Which one to use if you are in need of a, a good motion planning algorithm? Well, it's very hard to define best for these classes of, of algorithms. Often we want to look at several performance characteristics and OMPL makes this easy. The idea is as follows. Repeatedly solve the same problem with a desired list of planning algorithms, collect all kinds of performance measurements and store them in a database, visualize and interactively create plots that aggregate this data, then decide what to use. This benchmark functionality is implemented through Planner Arena. In fact, as we do not know what is interesting beforehand, we collect everything that might be interesting during benchmarking and interactively explore the results afterwards. Code for Planner Arena is included with an OMPL, a server can be run locally, and additional visualizations can be added. Planner Arena is also available as a Docker image. As I mentioned before, before because of its design, OMPL allows the fair comparison among different sampling based algorithms. In fact, average performance can hide large difference in variability among repeated uh, runs uh, for a randomized algorithm. OMPL gives you the mean to compare planners and understand which might be the best for a specific problem domain. For example, here, not the vastly different performance of well-known algorithms into different problem instances. This understanding has also led to the development of new and improved motion planning algorithms. Of interest are also visualizations that concern asymptotically optimal planners. Look at this plot. Four planners are shown for a particular problem instance. In this case, PRM star seems to have a better overall cost and convergence than RT star for a given time budget. So MPL allows you to discover the nuances of sampling-based motion planners. I use Planner Arena in my class. Students are surprised again and again every year that their intuition about which planner will work best for a problem phase them. Today, there are several uh, robotics simulation frameworks, uh, robotics middleware. OMPL is integrated uh, with ROS and Mubit, and this is probably how most people uh, use OMPL. As I said, several uh, frameworks exist for simulation and OMPL integrates with some of them, so robots can play the, the plans obtained by OMPL. Now let me discuss how OMPL has helped us as a group. I personally very much subscribe to the idea that in order to solve complex motion planning problems in variable settings, we need to find ways to meaningfully decompose a problem, and we also need suitable architectures on the robot side to help us do so. I like the architecture of an intelligent uh, robot that is composed of modules. There is a control module, a perception module for estimates of the state, an act module, a plan module. By making OMPL part of the plan module, we have been able to consider very interesting problems. Let's visit a few of them. Let's start with planning in real environment. In 2019, we collaborated with a group of Macarers in Spain, and Edward Vital considered the problem of planning for an autonomous underwater vehicle. The underwater domain presents several challenges and limitations. It is an unknown, unpredictable environment in where safety is paramount. The vehicle has nonlinear dynamics and several motion constraints, and importantly, limited computational resources. In this case, we only have a scanning profile sonar. We introduced a two-layered planning design. First, a fast geometric path planner computes a lead path from the start to the goal configuration. Then the lead path is used to bias the sampling of a second motion planning motion planner, an asymptotically optimal kinodynamic planner, which takes into account all the dynamic constraints. 
Our framework saves computational resources by generating the final trajectory only up to a finite horizon. Hence, it is, um, it is able to generate dynamically physical trajectories while keeping the planning time low enough for online planning. We also impose strong safety guarantees by always allowing safety continuous maneuvers to the autonomous underwater vehicle. The bottom of the slide shows, shows example where the planner succeeded in different trails in underwater uh, environments. Let me now use the case of planning with uh, um, manifold uh, uh, constraints. In general, obtaining general solutions for cases where manifold constraints are present is hard. An example of such a constraint is given in this figure. The tip of the robot needs to be on the blue ellipse drawn on this slide. Or consider NASA's Robonaut shown in this slide. NASA built this robot to assist astronauts in space. I will often refer to this robot as R2. Consider the case where the robot needs to keep the distance between its hands fixed because it is transporting a box in zero gravity. Several prior works are augmentations of sampling-based planners and combine search methodology with constraint satisfaction. This means that once you're using a particular planner, you're also bound to a particular planning strategy, which may or may not be good for the problem at hand. Inspired by the OMP philosophy, Zach Kingston pushed the satisfaction of a constraint from the planner to the search space by augmenting the space with functions used by sampling-based planners, that is sampling interpolation, function that OMPL implements. Decoupling sampling from the satisfaction of the constraint allows the choice of the best planner for the problem at hand. So in this case, one is free to choose the sampling strategy that is most appropriate for a problem, and the Zach's planner will take care of the constraint satisfaction. We show in our 2019 IGRR paper that this can make a huge difference, even determine if you can solve the problem or not. Theoretical results show that the framework preserves the probabilistic completeness and asymptotic optimality of the underlying sampling-based planner. Here is an example from actual experiments with Robonaut, not in space, but in the bay of the NASA Johnson Space Center in Houston. A robonaut is suspended by a black apparatus, it looks like a crane, and that simulates zero gravity. Look at the video on the left. A robonaut is turning a valve uh, with the hands doing a circular motion, while on the right it's pushing a door that separates two modules with the hand executing a straight line path. Um, we'd also like to, uh, to plan when there is not just one manifold constraint on the system, but when there are many possible constraints on the system. In this scenario, Robonaut 2 is in a simulated capsule of the space station. It needs to grasp a handrail at all times when moving from left to right, otherwise it may float in space. The problem with having R2 achieve uh, tasks such as this autonomously is the complexity of reasoning over the set of everything the robot can do, all modes of interaction the robot has with its environment. Robonaut 2 could grasp any handrail in this module and grasp that handrail anywhere along its length. Each grasp is a different manifold constraint, a different mode that we consider, and are two must essential constraints, grasping a new handrail and releasing the, previously, the previous one efficiently. But we need to choose what constraints to transition to in order to plan efficiently for these types of problems, and this can be a challenge. Now, a single manifold constraint corresponds to one specific grasp of the handrail. In this problem, we'd like to consider not just one grasp of the handrail, but all grasps of the handrail, where this corresponding constraint is parameterized by their location. So the grasp location is a parameter. In the next slides, I will show you how the R2, I will show you R2 uh, in a variety of valid grasps along the length of the handrail, each of which is a similar manifold constraint. The collection of all grasps, grasps on one handrail defines a parameterized family of manifold constraints which are continuously related. We call it a mod family. Here is one grasp, here is another, and here is yet another one. Also, in manipulation and locomotion problems such as these, there isn't just one family of constraints but multiple. In this example, R2 can grasp either handrail. 
Moreover, given uh, all the different families of constraints, there are only certain transitions allowed. For example, R2 just can hop with one limb to the next handrail. It needs to regrasp with its other limb first. In order to search the space effectively, an algorithm has to choose what transition between constraints to explore. We call this multimodal planning. Multimodal motion planning finds a path that transitions between modes within mod families. Okay, then the question becomes how to explore possible transitions. In his 2020 ICRA paper, Zach Kingston showed how to put all this together. Figure A in this slide shows a manifold in green and a path line on it. Figure B shows two mod manifold in Greek and in Magenta and a path that transition modes at a transition configuration Q prime. Zach estimated the difficulty of planning for any transition online, informed by the success or failure of manifold constraint planning. Hence, planning is used here indirectly, not because the plans are actually needed, but because they can inform a more difficult problem, that of multimodal planning. In collaboration with Andrew Wells, they used the online distribution of the difficulty uh, they computed using planning to inform their search. The underlying uh, tree planner is given uh, a sequence of desired transitions based on the lowest cost uh, uh, path uh, to a desired parameterization and mod family. Figure D shows a possible candidate transition sequence, hence a multimodal path. Now let's put it together. We have a general planner for manifold constraints that can change its underlying strategy depending on what the robot is or does in a way to move along different modes. Well, that can be powerful. powerful. Watch the robot not um, uh, uh, automatically compute how to move in its environment using handrails in this video. Multimodal planning may not be enough, however, for complex scenarios. There are task and motion planning problems that we cannot solve with the previous approach. Importantly, the ones that demand an order of temporal operations. Suppose R2 is asked to fetch a cargo bag from a storage area, take it to a room, and place a piece of equipment in it. To achieve these tasks that involve many steps and temporal relations, we need to plan both for task and motion. In general, we take some description of a, a task and a model of the robot and its environment. On one hand, we plan in the discrete task space to find the task plan. On the other hand, we perform motion planning to find the implementation of each of these actions. By combining these two, we generate a plan to execute uh, for the task. Our work showed that the combination of the discrete and the continuous components that I just described is not simple. Um, in work that span over five years, we do the following. We take a specification, typically in some formal logic or AI language, and an abstraction of the space and the robot, and we construct a graph, or in some cases an automaton, where a path from the initial uh, to uh, the final state in that graph represents a valid task plan, a plan that satisfies the specification at the task level. Then we start implementing each segment with a motion planner. This is where things can fail. And then what? Our understanding of sampling-based motion planner enables us to collect information about the difficulty of the problem, the motion planning problem, and this can be passed back to weigh the edges of our graph and signal that we need to look for a different lower weight task plan as uh, the uh, search for a path does not make uh, much progress. This is another example where OMPL planners are used indirectly to influence the solution of a larger problem. And here is an example of a task and motion planning problem that we can solve automatically. The robot picks up all cans, places them in a bin, and pushes the bin forward. This is work by Neil Dantan, who actually provided the first probabilistically complete solution for task and motion planning problems using probabilistically complete planners from the OMPL library. Let me finish with an example of OMPL used to support human and robots working together. Here is a problem that involves task and motion planning, but also a human who works with a robot. We need to stack the caps. We have a robot, we have an energy bound, and we have a human who may decide to help or not with a limited number of actions. 
So the problem is, given a formal specification and a model of possible human robot actions, synthesize a policy that guarantees the, speci that the specification is satisfied. We are looking for a policy and not a plan, and we also want guarantees that the specification will be satisfied. The way we solve this problem is through synthesis. What is synthesis? Given a specification, a synthesis technique automatically outputs a satisfying behavior. This could be in the form of a circuit, a problem, a program, or a policy. In a reactive system, we have a system that receives input signals, emits output signals, and may change its state. In our setup, we have a system where the human, that is the environment, may act. The robot may respond or continue, and we may have a new state. We solve our synthesis problem by converting it to a game. Think of the planning domain as the rules of the game, while the task is the winning condition of the game. Then finding a policy that guarantees task completion is like finding a strategy that guarantees the robot wins the game. We then deploy game theoretic approaches to find a winning strategy for the robot, and we use this to guide our robot's execution. The planning domain abstraction may sound easy, but it's actually extremely difficult to obtain automatically for a manipulator, for example. In our work, we use planners, yes, motion planners, to build automatically an abstraction of the planning domain. So we do not use motion planning to compute paths that are needed, but we use motion planning as a tool to aid in the solution of a bigger problem. We saw earlier exams where planners were used not to obtain paths, but to obtain information that helped the solution of a complex problem. Here, planners are used to construct an abstraction of the domain. We then use a symbolic representation of the abstraction we obtain. We also build a symbolic automaton uh, from the specification in order to solve this problem. I will illustrate the kind of solutions that we can obtain using an R5, uh, a UR5 robot in our lab. The task of the robot is to build an arc. The arc will have two white blocks as support, two black blocks as support, and a black block on the top. First, the human helps by stacking correctly the second black box. Then, however, the human negatively interferes with the stack by removing a white block from the arc. The robot, however, has a policy to complete the task and figures things out. And of course, in this particular case, we are fairly confident that OMPL will take care of the pick and place operations. So let me summarize and offer some thoughts. We have made huge progress towards the design of autonomous agents. There is no single solution that cuts all, and in my opinion, problem decomposition is a very important issue. In this talk, I showed you how sampling-based uh, planners are used in our work for the design of autonomous agents. OMPL has been an enabler for us, and despite the problems and the agony over the years to keep it going, the effort has been more than worthwhile. I gave you some examples on how OMPL has helped our group. It has helped us directly in obtaining fast planners, directly in designing planners with advanced capabilities, um, as in planning with manifold constraints, indirectly in exploring effectively the underlying structure of a problem, such as in multimodal planning, indirectly in obtaining solutions for task and motion planning and complex scenarios where humans and robots work together. We hope that the wide availability of the OMPL library will help others as it has helped us improve the state of the art in robotics for the benefit of all. Before concluding, I would like to thank multiple students who either contributed to the development of the library uh, by writing code, by, writing, by adding new functionality, or by helping us catch catch bugs when using OMPL in their classes and in their research work. Without them, OMPL would not have been possible. I have been using OMPL in my class for almost 10 years. I would also like to thank the many users of the library outside RISE who have shared with us their successes and their frustrations with the library, as well as, well as those who contributed their algorithms to the library. I hope that all those who have forked the library and had successes with it will contribute back to the community. Here's my current group and collaborator and collaborators and funding sources and our website for more information. I discussed the work of several of these people. And this is the end of my talk. Thank you very much for your attention and thank you for the invitation to discuss our work on OMPL.